I would like to introduce the one, the only, the mastermind behind uh, gun rights, Darren Wolf. Let's give Darren a round of applause. For our gun rights well, thank you, Steve, and thank you to everybody else for coming out tonight, of course. But I would especially like to thank the members of the audience who are keeping us safer here tonight by being armed. <laughs> Unfortunately, no discussion of gun rights can take place these days without talking about the uh, horrible murders that took place in Newtown, Connecticut last month. My heartfelt condolences go out to the families and friends of the victims, as well as my sympathies to the survivors and the rest of that community for enduring such a terrible experience. The gun haters say that because of Newtown, gun rights advocates need to pipe down and take whatever they want to dish out. And we even saw today uh, Obama beginning with his 23 diktats. Well, I say there's no better time than right now to dispassionately look at how and why we have a violence problem in some parts of the United States. The first thing that needs to be faced is that nothing is ever simple. The problem is very complex. Simplistic solutions like let's ban some weapons or let's put police in the schools aren't going to work for a number of reasons. <clears throat> no issue can be looked at in a vacuum. Well, therefore, as with any issue, we have to start with basic principles and moral implications. And that means talking about the one moral imperative that guides us in all human relationships, which is the non-aggression principle, the one that was so horribly violated at Newtown. <clears throat> it is immoral to... Um, to have to, uh, to begin any kind of aggression or initiate force or the threat of force against peaceful people. That means somebody has to be actually aggressing or credibly threatening to do so before you can use force in retaliation. Now, how does this relate to guns? The mere possession of an inanimate object, such as a gun, I have to use your imagination here, uh, aggresses against no one. There is no moral justification for taking guns away from people who adhere to the non-aggression principle because that would involve the use of force to separate them from their weapons. A property rights are part of the equation also. People have a right to their property. Guns are property. So separating people from their guns by force is theft of those weapons. Now no doubt we all agree that theft is immoral, right? There you go. Now, there is a moral justification for, at times, using force, and that is self-defense. Since the initiation of force is immoral, the right to self-defense seems obvious, and depriving people of their guns takes away their ability to use defensive force. Just another way that gun control is a violation of people's rights. Now, some might say, uh, well, that all sounds real nice in theory, but it doesn't really work in the real world. Well, let's take a look at how things play out in the real world. Uh, today, gun control is held to be a matter of reducing crime and making society safer. Now, here we can get into the statistics war. A study is produced, and then it is debunked. And then the debunking is debunked, and it just goes back and forth. But we need to cut through all the nonsense. When it comes to a crime, there really is no definitive statistical proof that points either way on this issue. Gun control and gun ownership are not panaceas that will wipe away crime completely. And the reason for this is that there are many factors that influence the crime rate and not just the availability of guns. But one thing that we do see is that within the United States, more guns in decent people's hands does tend to push down the crime rate. Some people say we don't need guns because the police will protect us. <laughs> well, actually not trying to be funny, but an important fact to consider here is that the police have no legal obligation to protect anybody. Uh, this has been affirmed by the courts in cases such as Warren v. District of Columbia and Ford v. Town of Grafton. 
In the latter case, Catherine Ford was actually advised by the police to get a gun to protect herself from her ex-husband. Uh, she ignored that advice, and unfortunately, she ended up shot and paralyzed. So even the police know they can't protect us, so we should know better too. And it does seem like this crowd knows better. <laughs> Now, sometimes the gun haters like to point to certain parts of Europe to justify, oh, your part, parts no, of Europe yeah. with low murder rates to justify gun control. I hear they're cherry picking their data. They're ignoring some inconvenient facts, let's say. For example, countries such as Norway and Switzerland actually have very high rates of gun ownership, but very low murder rates. While Russia has very strict gun control, actually has a murder rate four times that of the United States. Also consider that the murder rate went up in the UK when they banned their gun. They did their gun ban back in 97. Now, uh, obviously, while not in Europe, the Australian experience with their gun ban was the same. There's no doubt that a gun ban here would raise our crime rates too. While we're looking outside of Europe, there's a few things that are worth noting. Uh, for example, Brazil, with a low rate of gun ownership, has a murder rate many times higher than the United States. And if we look at one of our neighbors, uh, Mexico, they have strict gun control and an absolutely astronomical murder rate. Matter of fact, the United States ranks below the world average when it comes to its murder rate. Don't let the gun haters fool you when they talk about, oh, we have such a high murder rate. We, we rank below the world average. Regardless, uh, I've always considered that gun control, the crime aspect of gun control, is really a smokescreen for its real objective. Therefore, what I'd like to talk about is all the tyrannical governments that have killed, raped, tortured, enslaved, imprisoned, exiled, and stolen from the people they've disarmed. But that would take more than the three hours we have for the whole meeting here. <clears throat> gun control is, in reality, people control, and uh, starting from some very racist roots. Right In Maryland, the law once read that no Negro or other slave within this province shall be permitted to carry any gun or any offensive weapon. In Nazi Germany, the law read, next, here we go, oh, there we go. Jews are prohibited, not so fast, Jews are prohibited from acquiring, possessing, and carrying firearms and ammunition, as well as truncheons or stabbing weapons. So whether it was not allowing African Americans to own guns in this country, or not allowing Jews to own guns in Nazi Germany, the intent was the same, to have disarmed victims incapable of resistance. In the bloody 20th century, Mao Zedong summed it up perfectly. Okay. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Governments want disarmed victims. This is what Mao had in mind, and there are 70 million dead Chinese to prove it. They are only a part of the 200 million killed by governments during the 20th century. Every major genocide has been done by a government that implemented some kind of gun control. Now this is why there's never a good time to talk about disarming the people. What the discussion should be about is disarming the government. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there's some gun control we can get behind, right? There is a massive imbalance between the power of the government and the power of the people. It's not only the military, but the law enforcement establishments here are overwhelmingly strong. We need to start shifting that power away from the government by taking these functions out of their hands and putting them into the hands of the people where they belong. Now, one of the lesser known founders and also an anti-federalist by the name of Tench Cox, he explained it well. Picking up on the same theme as Mao, he wrote, Okay, here we go. He wrote. Yeah. Don't worry, guys. Okay. Who are the militia? Are they not ourselves? Is it feared then that we shall turn our arms, each man, against his own bosom? Their swords and every terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of an American. 
The unlimited power of the sword is not in the hands of either the federal or state governments, but where I trust in God, it will ever remain in the hands of the people. There's only one way to guarantee our lives and liberties, and that is to be stronger than those who seek to take them. This is why the Founders warned us against having a standing army. They knew that such a force would be used to oppress. Now today, the uh, standing army that we have to worry about is the huge law enforcement establishment. So I'm not talking only about state and local police, but also agencies, agencies like the Internal Revenue Service, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the EPA. And sure, ad, let's just say ad nauseum, how's that? Yeah. Rather than deploy troops on the streets, they use law enforcement to control us. And while these agencies exist, our liberties will always be in danger. In his greatest speech, and it was titled, Shall Liberty or Empire Be Sought? And actually advocating against adoption of the Constitution, Patrick Henry warned us, the honorable gentleman who presides told us that to prevent abuses in our government, we will assemble in convention, recall our delegated powers, and punish our servants for abusing the trust reposed in them. Oh, sir, we should have fine times indeed if the punished tyrants were only sufficient to assemble the people. Your arms, wherewith you could defend yourselves, are gone. Did you ever read of a revolution in a nation <clears throat> brought about by the punishment of those in power, inflicted by those who had no power at all? You read of a riot act in a country which is called one of the freest in the world, where a few neighbors cannot assemble without the risk of being shot by a hired soldiery, the engines of despotism. We may see such an act in America. A standing army we shall have also to execute the execrable commands of tyranny. And how are you to punish them? Who will you order them to be punished? Who shall obey these orders? Patrick Henry was right. Gun owners today can't stand up to the law enforcement establishment, much less the military. People that advocate civilian guns to counterbalance the government's guns are actually engaging in a dangerous fantasy that is rightly ridiculed. In the U.S., since the government can't disarm us completely, they have armed themselves to the hilt. This has a similar effect as disarming us. One only needs to look at the militarization of uh, law enforcement to see this. <clears throat> we need... Ah, there's only one answer, and that is institutional change, shutting down these agencies while building up the private means of defending ourselves. We need to move to a system of private security. There is no need for local police. We, history has already proved private security is better at protecting us than the government is. A shining example of this is from Oro Valley, Arizona. In 1975, they hired a company called Rural Metro to be their police force. They were providing the services that had been provided by the county sheriff. Crime rates were greatly reduced and at a fraction of the cost of a government police force. There is no need for national level law enforcement. Agencies like the one I mentioned, the ones I mentioned, the FBI, the BATFE, the DEA, and the IRS, they're merely instruments of oppression, enforcing mostly unconstitutional laws. One is reminded of Thomas Jefferson's words, warning against an overly powerful capital. Oh, very good. All right. <laughs> when all government, <laughs> domestic and foreign, and little as in great things, shall be drawn to Washington as the center of all power, it will provide, it will render powerless the checks provided of one government on another, and become as venal and oppressive as the government from which we separated. Not only is private security better able to protect people and their property, they have a provider-client relationship with them. Under this scenario, they have no incentive to, uh, to enforce anything like, say, the drug prohibition, and the government would not have the means to do so. 
Bear in mind that policing as we know it today got its start around the mid 19th century. It wasn't truly about preventing crime, its crime rates were actually quite low back then. It was about expanding the government's power and controlling people. Fast forward to today, and we see that the, word, the greatest threat to our lives, liberty and property, is the government. And this is due to their tremendous police power. The only way to restore our rights is to take that power away from the government. There is also a foreign policy aspect to this too. While the US government has a huge military to wield against the rest of the world, it will remain, and to quote Patrick Henry again, a powerful and mighty empire. A return to something like a militia-based defense is impossible while there is gun control. All too many that advocate peace also advocate civilian disarmament, not realizing that they're actually empowering the military that they so oppose. Now, digging deeper, we see there are other connections between foreign and domestic tyranny that maybe aren't so obvious. The communist, oops, the communist manifesto is actually a good place to start. In this book, Marx laid out 10 points, or 10 planks as they're sometimes called, that outline when a country has become socialist. Four of the 10 planks have been openly implemented in the United States. And we'll start with number two. There we go. A heavy progressive or graduated income tax. So not only does this provide money for the government's use, uh, such as fighting aggressive war, it gives it one of its worst um, organs of plunder and domestic oppression, the IRS. And then there is plank number five. Number five. There we go. Centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. That would be the Federal Reserve System, the United States Central Bank. So it is the greatest enabler that the government has. It creates all the easy money that finances their mischief. Then there is number six. Number six. Centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. The corporate media are but the government's propaganda arm. Using the public airwaves, they constantly hype the wars, glorify the troops and law enforcement at every turn. The government just owns the roads, most public transportation, ports, and airports. And this gives them control of all movement and vast resources. Lastly, there's plank number 10. Free education for all children in public schools. Government schools are in reality indoctrination centers. They churn out loyal citizens trained to unquestioningly support the state. <laughs> it's scary to think that how, how these points out of the Communist Manifesto are so mainstream today. Today, we live in a world of the progressive's creation, somewhere halfway between socialism and liberty. It is a world increasingly ruled by force, force wielded by a powerfully armed government. Whether it is the force of taxation, the force of compulsory education, the force of regulation, or the force of law enforcement, the effects are clear to all willing to see a society becoming <laughs> sicker and more aggressive. We have sunk a long way since 1850 when a Frenchman by the name of Frederick Bastiat wrote in his book, The Law, there we go. There we go. Is there any need to offer proof that this odious perversion of the law is a perpetual source of hatred and discord that it tends to destroy society itself? If such proof is needed, look at the United States. There is no country in the world where the law is kept more within its proper domain, the protection of every person's liberty and property. As a consequence of this, there appears no country in the world where the social order rests on a firmer foundation. They're sure not talking about us like that in France anymore. Yeah. 
Progressivism has failed to achieve its lofty ideals. Instead, it has created our present situation of crime and murder, war and empire. It is this failure that the advocates of, gov of gun control want to cover up. Instead of facing reality, the, instead of facing the reality, they want to blame guns for the problems the implementation of their ideas has created. Now, before anybody gets uh, too smug, I want to emphasize something. <coughs> Both political parties have adopted the progressive ideology. Today, so-called liberals and conservatives advocate different degrees of it and different aspects of it, but advocate progressivism, they do. Think of the four planks that I outlined from the Communist Manifesto. Those are many areas of agreement between liberals and conservatives. Another example, liberals may advocate gun control, but it is the conservatives who advocate the police state that can enforce it. Stop and frisk is actually a great example of this. Gun control is what drives it. While the liberals object to stop and frisk, they support its driving force. And while many conservatives advocate stop and frisk, they oppose the gun control that drives it. It's past time for both sides to realize the killing will only end. Society will only heal by turning it away from being ruled by force and toward voluntary interaction between its members. Basically, what I'm saying is that liberty is the answer. We, the society, our society starts to break down as we lose that liberty. Now, what we need to do to solve that? Institutional change. Disarming the government. Keeping the people not only armed, but organized to defend themselves. So let me close with one last quote. <coughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. It's an insightful quote about the relationship between power and liberty and who should wield it. This is from Representative Elbridge Gerry, incredibly these days, of Massachusetts. In 1789, during the floor debate over the Second Amendment, he said, now. That's my that's my signal. Okay, so. that's your signal. All right. Okay, so what, sir, is the use of a militia? It is to prevent the establishment of a standing army, the bane of liberty. Whenever governments mean to invade the rights and liberties of the people, they always attempt to destroy the militia in order to raise an army upon their ruins. Wishing you liberty, guns, and peace. Good night.